Uh, this is Kevin Barheit. And Kevin is the author of Dear Stephen Michael's Mother. Uh, I finished his book last week. It is a phenomenal memoir, and I recommend all of you to uh, order it on Amazon. We're going to do something special tonight, though, uh, that I'll share with that when we get Kevin back on here in just a second. But um, <clears throat> Kevin, again, has written a, a, his personal memoir. Birth. He is an adoptee. And he uh, succumbed to addiction and child uh, sexual abuse. And by age 20, he, the um, a shell of the boy he once was, he succumbed completely to, to a suicidal lifestyle of drug dealing and prostitution. At 45, after many years of recovery, Kevin began a painful journey to uncover his origins and the hopeful search for his mother. So uh, Kevin, we'd like to welcome you to our happy hour. Thank you. Good welcome, to see welcome. you. Good to see you, everybody. How are you this evening? I'm happy. I'm really in a good spirits. Again, it's my, I don't know if you heard me earlier saying it's my wife's birthday. I won't give you her age. She's uh, awfully excited. We just got off a Zoom call with our children that are, of course, you know, not here all over and uh, we're in good spirits. Everything's going well. That's great. That's great. Well, let, let's start the interview off if we could, please. I mean, some of you, I know you probably have some friends on with us this evening. Just tell us a little bit about you and the journey to start writing your book, when that was and what moment that was that, that took place for you to decide to write your memoir. Sure. Um, the, the first thing I want to say, if you don't mind, before I answer that question is how I ended up here in general. Um, to be here on the uh, Indiana Adoptee Network um, happy hour at, on this happy hour is is something I never, I never, I never thought I would, I would see myself doing. I was pretty shy. I was pretty uh, withdrawn and um, and afraid of the public eye for a long time. So I just wanted to thank you all for having me. Uh, you know, it's it's hard to do these things for me, even as as a speaker and someone who is now an author. You know, when I hear someone like Marcy put that put that you know uh, placard out there and say Kevin Barheit is, you know, I almost want to run out the door. You know, to hear these things, my heart pounds. Um, but it was really important, I think, uh, just to say the Indiana Adoptee Network wasn't something that was on my radar because I'm not from Indiana. And it just seemed like uh, something I, I wouldn't even find out about. Uh, but I was attracted to the work they were doing. And this was just a little over a year ago. And I wasn't a big Facebook guy. I wasn't a big social networking guy. But when I found out what you were doing, and then I realized we were having some changes in the state of New York that really mirrored some of the things that you had been working on for four years, it galvanized me. And that's what I think brought me to the group to begin with. Uh, and that's where I met you. And that's where I met Pam. And that's where I met other people like Anne Heffron and, and Haley and other people. And I just, th I just think this is just such a wonderful, a wonderful centerpiece. Uh, you know, the spider webs just go out forever and ever from here. And I'm grateful to be here uh, and to get to know everybody that's here and some of the folks I already do know. When I was, um, when I was beginning my search for my, my, my biological family in 2005, I had no clue that I would ever complete that search. So the idea of writing something about a search wasn't even on my radar. I think one of the best pieces of advice that some of the search angels gave me, and especially the very first, um, uh, the very first first mother who ever spoke to me about um, her relinquishing of her children, and then that she would guide me and help me and be a part of my life if I wanted to ever search, was to just stay in the day, just stay right in the moment. And there was a couple of reasons for that. Number one, completing the search in a blink of an eye would probably be something I wouldn't be ready for. And the process was more important in many ways that she explained to me than the result because the result was just so uncontrollable. Um, but I really did know, I think when I was about, he asked me about starting to write this. It's a story I don't tell very often, but during the time, it was a two year search. And during the time of the search, I would, I had a group of people that were just core to me. Some were adoptees, some were the, the first moms who were helping me and other people in the triad. and. I would send them emails. Again, I wasn't a big social networking guy, but I sent them Gmail emails all the time. And then what I realized one day, they would email me back and say, my gosh, Kevin, my gosh, you've got to write this. This is so exciting because every week I was telling them something was happening and it, you know, the story was going this way, then that way, then up, then down. And they said, you have to write this. And I just kept ignoring them. 
Uh, and then eventually when the search concluded, people kept saying, you have to write this. And I realized I had been. All those emails that I'd been sending, they weren't just saying, hey guys, uh, you know, this happened, that happened, this happened. I was, I was expressing my feelings. I was expressing the journey. I was expressing the thoughts and the sorrows and the joys. And so I looked at that. And again, I don't tell that story too often because it's more of the writing story mm -hmm. than it is the searching story. But I had that moment of realizing I've been writing this. And I went through all the old emails and started to gather them in a folder in my Gmail called, called um, Stephen Michael. That's all it was back then. Cause I, you know, I had found my name was Stephen Michael, but that's yeah. when it all started. But that was just about the journey when I really decided that I needed to write the story that ended up being this book was probably uh, about a year later after that. About a year later. So you began the book in what year? 2007 was when I started to germinate the idea. And right. 2008 was when I stayed up till three in the morning one, one night. And I, it's interesting because I know exactly where I was because I have a memory of it. It was on my couch at mm -hmm. my old house. But I also know what date and time because I followed through on that idea of emailing. So I got up at three o'clock in the morning, couldn't sleep. I said, you got to write something. And I went downstairs and I sat there and I wrote it in a Gmail and sent it to myself because I realized that the intimacy that was happening in the email process, I wasn't writing something you know, that I was gonna publish. I was writing something to express something, to tell right. something. Right. That was about, so it was about three in the morning and I remember in 2008, and that's when the real, that's in the first couple of paragraphs that ended up not just being the search, but ended up being the other part of the story started to take form. And before we go any further, I do want to mention to everyone, uh, we don't want to give too much away in, in the memoir uh, this evening, but uh, Kevin, in the spirit of holiday season, has offered to, to um, we're going to have a drawing for an autographed copy of his book. So if you're interested in being in the Enter to Win this evening, what we'll do is if you'll just pop your email address in the chat bar tonight. Uh, at the end of the evening, we will uh, select a winner and we'll announce that on the Adoption Happy Hour Facebook page. So if you're interested, pop your email Addy in there and for an enter to win. And okay. I just, I wanted to say that that was Marcy's idea and I'm so grateful for it. And I know there's most likely some people here that may have already ordered the book or read the book or they have the, even a physical copy. Um, I would love if you still did this because yes. I would love to number one, send you the autographed copy, but I feel like it's not my gift to you. It's your gift to me to accept it. And if you already have a copy, please give your other one away. Just pass it on. That's really mm -hmm. what I want. I, I, this is my only wish with all of this is to pass it on, but it was a great idea, Marcy. Great, great. Okay, so let's get into a little bit more of your story and let's talk about uh, where you're from and, uh, you know, where you were born and tell, tell us a little bit about that. You're from, you, you say you're from, originally from New Orleans. That's right. I've got an origin story now. I never yeah. had an origin <laughs> story. Some of it's got some wiggle room and some of it's got some, you know, loose ends, let's just say. But a lot of the blanks have been filled in in so many ways. From what I know, I was made in New Orleans. Now, uh, there's some, you know, loose ends there. So I, I don't have every moment and fact and figure there. But from what I know, I was made in New Orleans in Louisiana in 1961. And uh, my first mom, my mom, my biological mother, was, uh, was from New Orleans, but came here to a place called Rotterdam Junction, New York. Now, Rotterdam Junction is an interesting place. I was raised in a town called Rotterdam, but Rotterdam Junction is, is a little bit of a kind of a railroad track kind of, kind of location right near us. And I'm in Schenectady now, which is where Rotterdam is. It's Schenectady, New York, up near the capital of Albany. Uh, but she came here and lived at 300 Main Street, and she stayed here just long enough to, I think, get a job as a secretary. Um, but she gave birth to me. And that was in 1962, June 1962. So right in the baby scoop era, right in the, the, the piece of time. Now you know my age. Uh, June 27th, 1962 is the birthday. 
Um, and I expect you all to jot that down and I, I want cards, just kidding. <laughs> and, uh, but no, it's, it's, um, it's one of those things that was a complete mystery to me. I mean, this has not been about, I, I've never felt like I was trying to put pieces of a puzzle together. Um, I just felt like this was a mystery and there was just so many clues that were wrong and so many, so much information that I was given that was either incorrect or just misleading. You know, I was told my mother, my, uh, you know, my mother was from 200 miles west of here, which was absolutely not where she was from, not where I was made, not where I came from. But these were all the things that I was raised with. And by the time that I found out more about that. And again, most of that's in the book and you'll, you'll see that there. Uh, I was really in a place of wanting to know very little. I didn't think I had even a right to know all the details that I know now and all the details. All I really wanted when I started this search was a picture. That's it. Just a picture. I didn't think I deserved to know where she was from. Maybe not even a name, maybe just a face to put with my 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 the mystery the mystery that just seemed to be completely uh you know un, un unearthable there was no way that i could unravel it but i i wished for one thing and one thing only but that's where i was i was that's my origin story from what i understand and you know um i also remember too in the, the book um excuse me i have a mother in the nursing home just want to make sure that that was not, I had to take that. I'm sorry, guys. Um, and back to where I was. And as far as I remember reading in the book that there was one woman that uh, there was a very important moment in the book uh, with your relationship with Roz that changed and turned things around for you. And though you were a young boy and you knew that you were adopted and you wondered for years, you had this fear you had this desire, but you had this fear of search of the unknown. And it came out in one sentence, I think, with you and Ross, that made you, when you were scared, you want to tell us about that? You were really frightened when you had that conversation with Ross, but it was so, it's an important part of the book. It is an important part of the book. And it's, it's good that you use the word fear. Um, most of my life, and I, most of us can understand this and realize from if you've read The Primal Wound and you have found the pieces there that make sense to you, that there's a real hardship that comes with um, joy, even the possibility of joy. So the idea of even having a right to search for my biological mother, that, that felt really elusive just to have a right to do that. And I think that happens a lot um, with adoptees and with first moms. They just don't feel they have a right to even look for each other, even to begin to even ponder that. But the thing that I think the most, there was, there's always the obvious fear. And I think the book really highlights that, which is that fear of being rejected again my fear of looking and finding or even knowing, maybe even just knowing and having that rejection. Now, the other part, which is a little more, you know, nuanced, I think in the writing is that the other fear that was really painful was what if I did find her and she did love me and she did accept me and she did want me. Now I'm almost crying talking about it, right? Cause you know how that feels because I, I, I didn't trust that joy. I trusted that someone would reject me. I didn't trust that someone would accept me. And so the idea of Roz, Roz Peer, folks, uh, is not giving too much of the book away here. Roz Peer uh, was my boss at the time when I was living in New York City. And when I was leaving the job where I worked for her to move uh, to my new location, which is where I live now and the, the job I have up here, uh, she took me out for lunch and, and disclosed to me that she was a first mom and that she would be willing to help me. And that's the pivotal point of the story mm -hmm. that Marcy's talking about. Um, that fear was profound. One of the things that Marcy, you probably recognize is it wasn't just me sitting in that lunch with fear, was it? No, it was not. And you know, and if you don't mind, there's just, there are, Mark two sections. I just want to read one section, if you don't mind, that really hit home to me as a, as a mother. Um, this is in chapter two. Um, it, it says, I couldn't go to work. 
At the next off ramp, I stopped in Yada Garden, sitting and shaking and crying and thinking about how much I missed her, my mother who had no name or face or voice. How it killed me to miss her and not even know her at all. Yet somehow I did know her. Through the loss and the emptiness and the missing her, I knew her as part of my own lost sense of self, of how not belonging in this world, never fitting in, had become my identity. And I wonder how many adoptees feel the same way that you felt at that time. I think at various times in our lives that will come to pass. I think there's, it's funny you mentioned Yaddo, that, that passage is a place called Yaddo Gardens, which is in Saratoga, New York. And what's not in the book, and I will tell you here, I think it was originally in maybe one of the earlier drafts and we took it out. Um, that Yaddo Gardens is uh, a place that is, uh, there's a mansion there. And the mansion was used to be the Trask Mansion. Um, but the, uh, the family, the Trask family bought that, that lot of land um, as a farm, it used to be a farm. Uh, my name is Kevin Barheit. My adoptive name is Kevin Bar. That used to be Barheit's Lake, and that was Barheit's farm. That was a part of my my adoptive heritage, my adopted lineage, and that's the place that I pulled in, in that in that part of the book. So it has an extraordinary meaning to me, with the the almost the disconnects and the misconnects in life and how it um, how it manifested for me. I do. I do believe that if you read the book and you have Marcy, that you'll know that that was almost a fluke that that kind of came, that wave came and hit right, me like that. Right. I was literally driving to work and I heard something on the radio that just sideswiped me. I'm thank God that I didn't, you know, I was going 65 miles an hour driving down the road. Thank God I didn't try, you know, fly off the road with that. But yeah, there's a phrase that I think is in another part of the book. I know my mom, you know, I knew her all my life but I knew her by her absolute absence, exactly. her absolute absence. That was a phrase that I remember writing that. I don't even know where it came from. It, it almost felt like knowing God, but not knowing. Right? Yeah, there's those, those moments that hit you that come from, from nowhere. I think that's what happens. And in those moments, the deep thought and those feelings, those memories that are stored in your body, come out some of them and there's other parts of the book that of course talk about abuse and addiction and things yeah. like that and there's other parts that uh you know I, I might become aware of something that happened like the abuse or i'll become aware of something that uh you know regarding the feelings of abandonment that came out and sometimes they're quiet sometimes they are so quiet and they almost give me a sense of huh where did that come from but other times it's like that piece there where it just is like a tsunami. It's like a perfect storm hitting me. And I don't know, I don't, you know, I, I think the way I wrote it and the way I still sense it to me was I'm not going to be able to drive this car after this. There's no way I'm going to be able to function anymore. Right. That's how hard that was. That's how beat I felt. Um, and I think that's the point. We can drive the car again we're yeah. going to get to the next destination. It may not be the destination, it wasn't the destination that I thought it was gonna be because if you read the book right after that scene, I end up at work that day and bang. I mean, things that I, I never would have thought would happen. I meet somebody who knew somebody who was adopted, who, who, had, who had completed their search. And I can tell you that happened within hours of each other and that allowed me to start to realize that I could trust the process, that I could trust what Roz was telling me, that I could trust what then Michael told me later and that other people told me and brought me in and Judy and Beth. And when they talked to me about trusting just right in the moment, whether it's the loud voice or the quiet voice, whether it's the tsunami that feels like it's never gonna end and you're not gonna survive it or those aha moments, each one of them if we do it in community like this, we're going to, we're going to make it to the next destination. And then the next one, I'm not at my final destination nope. today. Nope. I'm, I'm, that's what I want to do. I want to look you right. I know there's a lot of people I can kind of see the zoom top bar here, but I want to be with you right now. I want to be here because I don't know what I'm going to find out, but I want to be, I want to be present for it the best I can. Yes. And <clears throat> why don't you, uh, I would like for our listeners, if, 
you could share a little bit about those first uh, seven years of your life, this happy childhood this, uh, that was traditional, a traditional upbringing as, as well. You know, you said you had a very happy childhood up until, uh, you know, there's an event that takes place. Sure. Um, I'll leave it up to you whether or not you want to disclose that at this point, but that was pivotal in your life that, that could have, that did change the course did. of your life. It did. And I, I'm, I'm capable and, and willing to chat about these things. And I want to point out something to maybe everyone who's listening, and you may not see it just the way I do, but me, Marcy and I are looking at each other on the full screen. So the rest of you are in either little boxes or gallery, but I'm looking directly at Marcy. Now, we are talking about some fairly serious things, and we're about to get into some abuse, and we're going to talk about... But I'm sitting here and I will put a full disclaimer. I've just started to do this recently. I'm so happy these days. My life is so good. I feel so, there's not that I am perfectly happy, but I'm so happy that I'm even got the, the amount of happiness I have. Now, the fact that I can sit here in one piece and have these conversations is amazing. Now, the fact that I can keep a straight face while I'm talking about these serious things, looking at Marcy with two Santa Clauses bouncing <laughs> off her noggin is even more right? More amazing. When I was, when I was uh, adopted, uh, I, first I was in foster care, but very quickly after that, Catholic Family Charities placed me with my, my, my adoptive family. And they were a family that had tried. Uh, they were a husband and wife that had tried to have children and couldn't, they could not conceive. I think they tried for quite a while. And there's some fun stories about them trying that my mom told me, uh, TMI mom, don't, don't need to know about all the trying. But the real piece was that dad was, uh, you know, a guy who worked at GE and then worked for the federal government, worked for the IRS. Mom was a stay-at-home mom. You know, we had, you know, a car in the driveway. We had a, you know, corner lot. And life was pretty simple and pretty straightforward in a little town called Rotterdam and Schenectady, New York. And Rotterdam is a town that is in Schenectady, which is a nearest city, and near Albany, which is a capital. But we're also 15 minutes away from, you know, cows and farmland and corn, and um, we have a real rural sensibility here. And one of the things that some of you may or may not know of is called 4-H, and it's like a boys, Boy Scout, Cub Scouts, things like that. And my parents, uh, with some of the other parents in the neighborhood, would put us put their kids in 4-H, and that was just a, something that you did once a week or so. You went to you know a place, someone's home, and you had a leader, a 4-H leader, and they teach you about the environment and about the um, agriculture and things like that. Um, unfortunately, and I'll, I'll I'll cut to the chase. My our 4-H leader um, was also a pedophile, and. That was unbeknownst. I was, uh, I think you said Marcy seven. I was nine. You're nine. Yeah, no, I know. It's 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 the numbers seemed a little bit uh, <laughs> off there, but I was nine years old, and of course these are memories that I carried with me as deep in my DNA and in my brokenness uh, as I did the original primal wound. But it seemingly, and many people have said this, well, you know, and you guys have heard this before, well, you're only adopted. You know? And I say, so I say to people, some, you're right, maybe if I was only adopted, and I say that with big air quotes, you know, maybe I would have been okay. Or maybe if I was only adopted and I was abused, and they say, oh, you were abused. Oh, well, that answers the question. I'm like, well, wait a minute. No, I, I you know, I also, you know, was an addict, an alcoholic. And then it starts to make sense to them. People want you to have a certain sensibility of your suffering a certain avenue that they can kind of follow, a little path that they can say, well, that makes sense. Um, but I will say quite honestly that uh, I, I don't know, maybe if I had never been abused, maybe things would have been different. Um, but I can understand now that these are what's called compounding traumas. So one trauma wasn't one trauma and two traumas wasn't two. They fed off of each other. Uh, what also happened right after the abuse happened, uh, the, um, 4-H leader uh, who had uh, abused me and several of the other kids. Uh, my dad got ill right around the time I was 11 years old. Now he had been ill for many years. I think depression was undiagnosed or depression was undiagnosed and we know that now. But the other thing is we think he had a heart condition early on because he had struggled with his health even, even before I was born. But everyone just thought he just had some kind of a nervous condition, um, passed out at work, things like that. And they just didn't understand that his arteries were clogged. And so by the time I was 11, 
Uh, I had been abused, I had been adopted, and the abandonment issues were really seeping their way into my understanding of who I was and how I fit into the world around me and felt misplaced. Uh, and then my dad, uh, that was the other piece. And I, I always like to tie those together because again, maybe if only the abuse had happened, maybe if dad had been stronger, I always put these up there as, as things that seem like they would be options. Like if we could rewrite history, we could just, we could rewrite all these stories. We could rewrite these travels and I would just be okay. And I wouldn't be here on this call with you now. And I never would have written the book and I would just be hunky-dory moving along. We like to, I think I, for many years, lived in those fantasies that I should be okay. I should be fine, right? Only this happened, only that happened. But you're right, that was the big kind of turning point. And I will be crude uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the verbal expression of that. That's when I learned that I was a piece of meat. It's when I learned that adults had an, uh, an understanding of me as an object. Um, and I think what I've understood in the years that I've worked on this and worked very hard on this is that tied in quite, quite easily, I wouldn't say nicely, but quite easily with the first, the first objectification, which was that I was, I was, um, I was relinquished and there was a trans, I was transaction. There was a transaction from where I was made and created uh, to where I, I would next be, be put. Um, and that's, that's been some of the real pain that's monopolized most of my life as, an, as a youth and as an adult. So these false narratives set in at that age nine that you believed about yourself, that you were a piece of meat, you were worthless, you were unlovable, and that opened up this pathway to become an addict. It was really a strong desire to not be in my own skin. And I wouldn't have known, I think there was a lot of clues. And if, if you read the book, you'll see that I started to act out. And again, this really goes back to Nancy's book. If you start to read The Primal Wound, I mean, when I first read The Primal Wound, I had to throw it across the room every other paragraph because I felt like, you know, someone was sneaking up behind me and going, hey, remember me? And I had to look at so many of these under, you know, to understand, understand why I maybe behaved in a certain way or thought a certain way or felt a certain way. But yes, there was a real change that started to happen even before the drinking, even before the drugs and the stealing and the acting out and the misbehaving and all these pieces that were put into place. And my, I, I will say this with all the love in my heart, I think, and my poor parents were just beside themselves. You know, I mean, they had me who they thought was their golden child who was turning into a rage, just a rage, not a raging something, just a full rage. They hadn't known that I was abused. I didn't know I was abused till much later in my life. I didn't identify what had happened. And there was no keys that would help them unlock the primal wound and the adoption issues and the relinquishment. They just didn't have that. And on top of that, my dad was ill. On top of that, my dad had no physical ability to really step up and my mom had to go back to work. So some of these are perfect storms, but some of them are just perfect storms on top of perfect storms, seemingly never ending. When I had my first drink, I was 11 years old. That was and my next question. I was 11. Tony Rotundo and I got on the railroad tracks. He was about a year or two older than I was. And he said, what are you doing this Friday? I said, nothing, what do you wanna do? And he said, let's, let's go over. Tony had taught me how to smoke cigarettes. So he was the coolest person in the world. Tony brought me over to the railroad tracks and we had two six packs of Schlitz. Yeah. If anybody remembers Schlitz, you know how bad that beer is. If you know how bad that beer is, you know how bad it is when it's warm Schlitz, because by the time we got to the railroad tracks, it wasn't cold anymore. And I had six beers. I drank the entire six pack. I don't remember much of that night except, you know, silly gibberish for, for a young kid and also a drunk young kid. But I remember the next morning clearly, um, because I think I really woke up that day and maybe being as young as I was, I was able to get through maybe the, the hangover a little better than I would if I was you know, hungover today. Uh, but I remember waking up the next morning and thinking very clearly, now I know what I wanna do for the rest of my life. It was just an absolute, there was no wiggle room for that. I knew that I felt that the gyro in my head that never ever stopped had stopped just temporarily while I was drinking. And I woke up in the morning, next morning and I said, that's what I'm gonna head for. Now, I didn't know what that gyro was. 
maybe it was some mental illness. Maybe it was bipolar, mood disorder. There's a lot of pieces. Maybe it was the depression that had thrown me off. Um, much of it, what I've identified is the anxiety that comes from the traumas. Uh, those are, that's the simplest definition. So from, from that point on, uh, fill us in just again, uh, as you want to, as, as the information that you want to release to people that haven't read the book yet, um, about how the desire for alcohol and the desire for drugs escalated to a point that this was, here you were, this young man, this young boy, teenager, and you fell into this addiction to where you, that you were doing this daily and you were breaking in houses to get money for your addiction. Yep. And your parents knew some, you know, obviously your parents were involved and they tried to offer you help and you had all, you, you did have a, a circle out there, a, a family that was trying to help, but you were lost. I was lost and that's a very typical addiction story. If any of you ever wanna read about addiction or you, some of you may, and I think David's here, we could talk to him later about this, but the, there's a great book by Judith Grizel. It's called Never Enough. Mm -hmm. And if you haven't read it, don't need to, but I, it's my Bible now. It's the equivalent to me of the primal wound in many ways. And she's a, uh, I've been sober now for 35 years. January 1, will be 35, very happy coming up. Uh, she's been sober just as clean and sober as long as I have. Um, and we both got our lives together. Uh, she's a, a neuropsychologist, I think a neuropsychiatrist. So she's just incredible. So we kind of had different trajectories, you know. <laughs> I became an author, she became a neuropsychiatrist, I think, a neuro something. Uh, but she studies addiction. And her book really helped me to understand exactly because she, hers is not a memoir, but it does go into the personal experiences that she. Uh, she went through. And they're very similar to mine, very similar to any addict. The pieces that I think probably would be most of interest are how that rolled out. So here I am 11 years old and I'm, you know, uh, dealing with the abuse, dealing with these sense of being a piece of meat that started to change how I treated myself and how I thought of others. Marcy used a phrase that I had low self-worth. Um, mine wasn't low, mine was below zero. I had negative self-worth. It, it took me a while to understand the difference between that. If I had a little bit of self-worth, I might've felt I had hope. If I had a little bit of self-worth, I might've felt that I could have asked for or accepted some of the help around me. But I was on the negative scale at that point. And again, probably uh, the easiest way for me to understand that is to realize that it started right out of the womb with the primal wound and now has really, really set itself almost uh, in, a, in an irreversible uh, stance from the abuse. But by the time I had that first drink, I was off to the races. I immediately uh, went and found more drink. Whether it was my parents' liquor cabinet or uh, with Tony or with other friends, uh, I learned very quickly how to acquire and ingest as much alcohol as I could. I also looked at drugs as being something that was an option. I didn't know why, but I wanted to experiment immediately. And when I was 12, I had my first overdose and, and I was, had my stomach pumped and no one really knew exactly what was wrong with me because I didn't have any drink in me that day. So they didn't understand what was happening to me, but I was out for about 36 hours and uh, finally was able to uh, come back to consciousness. That was a real terrible experience, but it didn't stop me. The next day was just, now let me see how I can how I can tinker with this, drink a little bit, do a little bit of drugs, drink just so much so that I'm not getting sick, drink just so much so that I'm not as obviously falling down drunk. So it was really what a lot of alcoholics and, and drug addicts look at as you're trying to maintain some balance. By the time I was 13, I was on probation. As Marcy said, I had been starting to rob houses and um, just, to, just to supply my habit. But I think there's a real essence to that part of the story too, that's important to really just bring out here, which is, yes, I needed the money, but I could have gotten the money in other ways, right? I could have worked for goodness sakes. I even did have a paper route. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I didn't even need the money, but there was an acting out that was just so prominent in every morning, noon and night activity that I had, whether it was doing the drink or doing the drugs or lying or stealing or smashing my fist into walls, whatever was happening, there really wasn't a reason why it should be happening. I didn't need to do these things and yet I couldn't stop myself. And it really spiraled out of control. By the time I was 14, I was taken out of my parents' home, my adoptive family's home, I was put into foster care. 
My first foster home, they were alcoholics and I ran away from there. The second foster home was worse. They had alcohol and drugs. Uh, I ran away from there three times. Uh, there was abuse in that, in that household. Uh, the foster mother was very abusive towards me and others, but mostly towards me while I was there. Uh, and then I ended up in a group home. So I went from a foster home to another foster home, to a group home, to a detention center. And eventually by the time I was uh, 16, I was, uh, well, actually I was 15, uh, almost 16. I was placed back into my adoptive family. But by that point, I was long gone. I was far gone. I didn't have, it was like going back. I think I wrote in the book, it was like going back to a country where I didn't know the language. You know, I went back into my parents' house, but I didn't belong there and I didn't belong anywhere. So I hit the streets and things got pretty, pretty out of control really quick. Unfortunately, there was another abuse that happened when I was 15. I was gang raped in Schenectady here uh, by two men. Uh, and that sent me on, I think, a final, if I would say a final, <laughs> doesn't seem like there was ever a final to this, but a, another very large trajectory towards a very, very um, uh, sequential uh, amount of hard bottoms, uh, including prostitution, ending up on the streets, um, drug addiction, dealing drugs, uh, not being able to keep a job, getting, I, my, my oldest daughter was born when I was 16, my second was born when I was 17. Um, I joined the Navy when I was 18. I was, my wife left me when I was 19. The Navy threw me out by the time I was 19. By the time I was 20, I was on the streets and prostituting. It's a story. There's a lot that goes on between uh, the uh, that age of 15 until you're 20 years old. There's a lot that happens in, in the story. Um, okay, what I'd like to do at this time, since it is uh, going on eight, we would like to go ahead and open it up. I don't want to take all the time, and I'd like others to uh, come in and see what kind of questions they have for each other. Is that okay? Yeah, that's wonderful. And I'm glad you asked the questions about the hard stuff. And I and I know that you know there's some people that maybe I don't want any any of this to trigger anyone. So please recognize that if you need to bow out, we totally understand that. Um, I'm trying to hold back on some of the real, say, gruesome details, uh, but I think it's really important. The reason I speak about them so openly is because I'm sitting here healthy. I think it's that's also the very same reason why I wrote the book the way I wrote it. I wrote the book the way I wrote it because each day that you're reading about this, these travels, these pains, these agonies, uh, you know that the person writing it made it through in some way, shape, or form. And that's why I want to sit and be honest with you today. If you have a question, I'll try to answer it as long as, it does, as, long as it's not a spoiler. How's that? Yeah, there you go. Oh, does somebody have a question that they wanted to start off with? Um, and I don't really want to put anybody on the spot, but so, David, you're here with us tonight, aren't you? I am. I'm sure glad you didn't want to put anybody on the spot, though. <laughs> <laughs> she, she's good at she's good at not putting anyone on the spot. Well, I thought as someone who is a professional in uh, addiction and recovery, that you just might want to share a little bit uh, or make a, a few comments on what you have. You read the book yet? I have. I have for sure. Okay. All right. So good. Then I don't need to say anything else. Then. Okay. So I thought you might want to. Uh, make a few comments on, on what Kevin shared with us. And sure, sure. Well, it was it was uh, a, a, an incredible read, um, and it wasn't just a read. Of course, it was Kevin's life experience, and I really appreciate his courage in um, sharing his narrative with us because it was not an easy one to share. And I'm so delighted to hear that you're 35 years down the road, past using some substances as an unhealthy coping me mechanism, but even further down the road, emotionally and mentally and intellectually from all of those, those horrible things that happened. So thank you, Kevin, for that. We certainly appreciate that. Um, in addition to that, you know, I don't want to diagnose Kevin. He's, you know, he's, he's, he's um, certainly had some experiences that we've seen repeat themselves, not only in the addiction and recovery communities, but also in the adoptee and relinquishing communities. It's not unusual for uh, adoptees to experience uh, rates of addiction and or other mental health symptoms at, at, at rates that are much higher than the general population. And and Kevin's experience can certainly be used to illustrate that in his coping mechanisms in terms of protecting himself. He said he had zero self-esteem, right? I would, I, would, I would suggest that he was using many of those coping mechanisms to protect a very fragile sense of self. 
and, and story after story. And I'm not saying he brought any of this on, right? He was not to blame for the horrific things that happened to him, but they certainly did not contribute to a feeling of well-being and a feeling of self-confidence about himself. Um, what I'm really interested in, I hope I'm not ruining any upcoming books. I know, Kevin, I, I, I saw an interview that you did with some friends of ours in the adoptee community where you talked about having ideas for some books further on down the line and you had a title for book number three, but you weren't sure what book number two was. I'd really love to hear, and maybe it's not appropriate or maybe in a general way you're willing to share, what happened? What, how did you get from that place 35 years ago to the, the um, incredible individual that you are today? You're right. And just for anyone that has not read the book, I I'll, you know, won't throw any real spoilers in here, but the book ends in two different ways. It's two stories and they're parallel journeys. One is the two year search for my biological family. The second part of the story is from the time I was born. So what happened after I was relinquished till about 23 and a half years old, almost you know, 24 years old, which is when I got sober. Now you know my age. So that those two stories um, really parallel each other. And that's the way the book was written. It alternates and goes back and forth between the two. And I, I think that's what keeps the reader, number one, engaged, but number two, gives you a little relief, right? Because some of those stories are hard and it breaks up some of the harder parts of the story. But you're right, the story ends with the, uh, the, the search concluding. And that's a big, that's a big uh, spoiler that I won't throw out there. You'll have to read that to find out how that happens. But David's really asking me about what happened after I got sober. And how do I get from that time when you kind of hit bottom and then you rise up, you start to move forward. And I haven't had a drink since January 1, 1986. I haven't had a drink or drug. I've been awfully close. I've been awfully close. Um, and I will say that for the most part, those travels seemed, I don't want to use this word lightly, but those travels seemed boring to me. Writing about those in the book seemed like they were almost um, too much to ask to really talk about the recovery process in a way that would fit the storyline that I was trying to expose uh, uh, the people, everyone to. It's funny though, when I finally finished this manuscript and got all of the developmental editing done and I read it and then I read it again, when I finished it, I re it really hit me that there was another book. And it wasn't because I ever intended to, I didn't want to write a trilogy, I didn't have any ideas, but I realized that was the gap. And I'm not sure how I want to do it, but there's two stories that I'd like to put into a second book. Number one is what happened after the search concluded, right? What happened? What's my life been like from the time that the search concluded, say to the time that this book was published? What are those years like? What's happened? And I do want to tell that story. I don't want to tell it today because it's too much of a spoiler, but I do want to talk about that. The other piece is what, how did I do that? And I think some of the real pieces are I didn't do it alone. One of the biggest things that I did was I made sure that I reached out for help. When I was in a group home, when I was, um, when I was a kid, like I said, foster homes and then a group home, there was a woman named Jane McCarthy who had been my therapist. She's passed now. But before she passed last year, I was able to share with her that my journey had, had ended well, or at least was ending well. When I was through those years of prostitution and drug dealing, I ended up in jail quite, quite often. I would call Jane before I even called the lawyer, before I called my parents, somebody to bail me out, I'd call Jane. She said, Kevin, what are you calling me for? And I didn't know. I'd be in jail, sitting in county jail and lockup, and her number was the one I called. It's because I wanted some help. I just didn't know how to ask for it. But on January 1, 1986, when I stopped using the drugs and alcohol, my bottom had just dropped out permanently at that point. I couldn't function anymore. I was suicidal. And not only didn't I think that I had worth, I didn't think I deserved to be here. I was suicidal, felt like I should be annihilated and felt like I never deserved, and you'll understand this, to be born at all. Should never have been here. And then I hit that emotional turmoil that David's talking about. And I didn't know what to do. I had no clue, but I reached out to Jane McCarthy. I called her on the phone and asked for help. Now, what I will say after that happened was a long journey of finding the right kind of help. Some of it was in the 12 step programs. And I found that, I found that has been very effective for me. It was also in therapy. 
It was also in now the adoptee community. And it's also now been a part of my life to be a part of the recovery community from those who have really been exposed to any kind of uh, child sexual abuse. So I find that I do much better when I find the communities that have, have lived through, or at least have a deep understanding of the traumas. And I didn't know that going in, but thank goodness that slowly but surely I was able to unearth that. Thanks for the question, David. Sure, very well said, Kevin. And I really like that you said finding communities who have that knowledge of trauma, right? Because people have come at life from all different angles. And if a 12 step fellowship doesn't work or if they can't find the right adoptee community, there are all kinds of supports out there of people who understand trauma's impact on our personal development. So thank you very much, Kevin, for that. You're welcome. And the word community has meant so much to me. And I'll just finish on that. And I think you're right, and I know you're right, that it's not about finding the perfect community to be in, it's finding the perfect community to be in today. Where's the one that is going to help me to take the next step forward? I am not, I am nowhere near the man I was when I you know, uh, started walking in these, in these shoes to try to heal. But the compounding traumas have turned into compounding healing. I didn't do that alone. I needed people. My last question for you, Kevin, um, and I'll, again, I'll open it back up to uh, the others. What's your message of hope to, to someone that's pro that is suffering from an addiction right now? Well, you know, when we talk about these, uh, as I say, these different silos of uh, the adoption, the relinquishment, the abandonment, then the child sexual abuse, and the third for me is the, the addiction. Um, each one, I think, there is hope. I, I, I do know there is. I have to be really honest when you ask me about addiction, there's also death, there's also despair, and there's also relapse. And there's also sometimes, uh, even though I'd like to say there's hope for everyone, uh, I've lost people. I've lost people in addiction. Um, I've lost people that I sponsor in the 12 steps. Uh, if you, uh, upstairs in my bedroom, I have a, a, a beautiful, um, a beautiful memory, uh, uh, remembrance of one of the sponsees that I, that I lost. Um, his mother gave me, after they cremated him, they took his ashes and they made it into jewelry and I have a piece of that. Um, some of us die, some of us don't make it and uh, some of us relapse. I think one of the best things to understand and it's really become, I think, more prevalent in the adoption and recovery, or, sorry, in the addiction and recovery community and especially in the treatment of them is that relapse is often a part of the healing process. Um, just as say from child sexual abuse, I didn't just one day realize I had been abused and everything went away and I got better and I was able to live a productive, healthy life and get married and have children. And no, that was awful. Just turning from someone who recognized that they, they for years had been treated like a piece of meat. And then all of a sudden I'm going to be in a, in a, in a healthy relationship. It doesn't work that way. But the idea was that I can have these iterations of, of, of health. So I think that when it comes to the adopt, uh, when it comes to the the addiction, that's a tough one for me to answer because I do have to understand that many of us sometimes die, and many of us do end up hospitalized or institutionalized, and our families really suffer the consequences. Addiction has far-reaching consequences. It's not just the person who is using. Mm -hmm. But I think there is hope, and I think that understanding that it's not a moral dilemma, this addiction is a disease. And it's understanding for me that the progress I need to make isn't the progress that anyone else needs to make. I'm not in a race to be the most sober person in the room. All I need to do is not use today and do it in community with other people. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Anybody have a, want to start off with a question for Kevin? I haven't paid much attention to the chat bar, Jennifer. Did anybody have any questions in the chat bar? Anybody? No questions? I'm sure we've got a lot of questions. Well, there was a, a question that was posted a while ago. It says, um, does society look at adoptees or children up for adoption as a commodity to sell and buy? What do you think, Marcy? Let's talk about that. Mm. 
I think I think uh, I'd like to hear from some of the adoptees how they feel about that. I know how I feel about it. <laughs> Society is a big Donna, word, right? you're raising your hand. Oh, good. Somebody else. Good. Would you like to come off of mute, Donna? Thank, thank you. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, what's called and by some people commoditization. Um, I think that one of the things I've had to come to terms with as an adoptee is the fact that it was never about me as a person. It was just the next baby. My uh, adoptive parents had two biological sons that my mother had traumatic pregnancies and births and was told not to have any more. But all her sisters had a daughter and she really wanted a daughter. And it was like any daughter would have done. The fact that she and I did not mesh and I, you know, completely did not meet her, her idea of what her, what I, I think of as, you know, ghost children that we have to take the place of, of people who don't or can't exist. You know, I finally decided I'm just an avatar for what her daughter would be. And I've taken to imagining what that person would be like. And I can picture her, but it's it's not me. So I think that that in terms of buying and selling, in 1958, I didn't cost very much. Um, my dad would always say, you cost me 50 bucks in lawyer's fees. And I'd say, well, you get what you pay for, dad. So um, that was our little running joke. But I, I think that a lot of um, HAPs, you know, hopeful adoptive parents just really focus on, on getting that, that baby to, to put into the slot that they've created. Sometimes even a, a whole nursery is waiting for whatever baby. And that's, that's hard and I'm a mother, it's very hard to, um, to picture wanting that and wanting to essentially profit on another family's loss. I mean, we're all born in, in trauma and loss. And then for some of us, it just gets worse, like for Kevin and for, I had a, a really bad adoptee experience and still, you know, I'm even older than Kevin. I'm still, uh, you know, disentangling it. So anyway, I don't know if I answered the question, but. Thank you, Donna. Thank sure. you for sharing that. If I can jump in, this is Lori. Um, thank you for sharing that. I, there was just something that Kevin said that made me think of, of adoptees as being commodities. And I do think our society kind of thinks that way, at least maybe the the adoption um, um, centers or whatever, I think they think that way. Um, and whether they really try to place us, I, I can relate to what you just sh shared because both of my adoptive parents had two natural sons and my mom wanted a daughter and um, was told by doctors she shouldn't have more children um, because both of my brothers were uh, cesarean sections right. and they were born in the 50s and back in those days if you have two cesareans you weren't supposed to give birth to another and yes I never met my mom's requirements she wanted a daughter but I don't think she wanted this daughter because we were so radically different in personality and and appearance and everything, even though I think the adoption, the adoptee, or um, um, I think the they tried to place, you know, uh, as much as they could, but we were so radically different. And um, unfortunately, my mom just never really let go of the her disappointment. Um, so I suffered a lot of verbal abuse, mm -hmm. um, which to this day I still struggle with. 
I never got addicted to anything, except that I will say the first probably 40 years of my life, I was in a performance trap trying to perform for my adoptive parents, thinking, oh, if I'm an honor student, if I do all the work all around the house, if I do all the yard work, if I do all this and obey them and don't complain, they'll finally accept me. But they constantly compared me to their natural sons who were human and not perfect, but in their mind, they were perfect. And I was the terrible one. <laughs> So uh, anyway, um, which I just think, you know, I don't know. And, and you talk about a low, what do you call that? Um, adoption fee. One of the things my dad told me when I was about 10 and we weren't arguing or anything. It, it, I was setting the table, but out of the blue, I think his dad had just passed away or something. I'm not sure what brought the topic up but he actually told me I paid a thousand dollars to adopt you and that wouldn't be enough to pay for your burial which you can imagine how I interpreted that so um like okay I have no value I guess anyway um <laughs> um I was just curious I was just curious I just it just seems like at least with the adoption what do you call them uh centers or whatever um i just think they're into making the money i think you're right laurie and it, that's why i wanted i'm glad we opened it up because it's it's hard to answer those questions without context you know i i don't I, the word commodity immediately puts me in a state of wanting to talk about business because that's what commodities are they're part of transactional businesses and I think for me, I use that word transactional. Um, I, I understood growing up that my parents loved me and I don't think that they didn't love me. They had love to give. If you ask my 91 year old mother who is quite literally sleeping in a chair directly above me right now because this is my adoptive mom. Uh, she's 91, my, my adoptive father's gone and, and I care for my mother. She would tell you, she would tell you at the book launch she was interviewed for five minutes. And one of the things that just came out of her mouth was, we just had love to give. That was her transaction. I have something to give. I don't have a child to give it to. So I'm going to get a child. So everything felt very transactional to me. And I don't think I really put that together as a child. There wasn't anything that I could have put my finger on. Um, and then when the abuse happened and things other things happen to really show me and make me understand that uh, adults treated me as, as an object or as something that was transactional. I think the word commodity comes into play, as you say, when it comes to the idea of how our industry, and I will say that rather than society, how our industry, either in our country or other countries, uh, takes advantage of those people and ideas uh, that maybe are founded not so much in transactions or commodities, but in a need that needs to be defined. And unfortunately, I think for my parents, that need was defined as you have love to give. And so this is where you're going to give your love. We're going to give you a child that someone else loved. So now you can love them. That's a, real, that's a real hard thing for someone to wrap their minds around. You have to go down a lot of rabbit holes in my mind to justify that. I'm not saying that's a, it's a wrong thing. I think it's maybe human nature. Yeah. And I think that when I listen to my, 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 my mother, her understanding, uh, and it's in the book, uh, they used to go up to the Basilica of St. Anne, which is, a, if you don't know what a Basilica is, it's like a, a a really, really huge Catholic church. It's so big that it's, it's monstrous. And they would pray to St. Anne. And if you don't know who St. Anne is, I call my own personal St. Anne as Anne Heffron. But St. Anne uh, was Jesus's grandmother. So it was Mary's mother. And they would pray. So they not only wrapped their understanding of the transaction of what to do with their love into I'm going to get a child to love. They actually had to go deeper than that and make it into something that was a gift from God. 
And they had an adoption agency, Catholic Family uh, Charities at the time, now called Catholic Services, uh, that reinforced that understanding, reinforced that, that dynamic so that they could then find a way to express not only their love for me, uh, and again, I'm not saying they're uncaring, unloving people, but in a way that was socially acceptable. So I think that there is a business in the commodities piece, and I think that's industry. But I think then there is also a societal piece, and that's the word you use was, our, is, does our society want that? I don't know if our society as a whole uh, really wants to think of it that way, but we will. it seems like we will jump through any hoops we have to to rationalize and justify adoption. And I'm, I won't go pro or con on all of the um, possibilities of how this could be quote unquote fixed, the foster care system, the adoption system. Uh, but I think that society is through these kind of meetings and these kind of chats and us speaking up uh, and groups like uh, the Indiana Adoptee Network making uh, not just statements, but um, you know, putting together a body of work and an understanding of how a, maybe society can look at it in a different way. But I think industry, where there's money to be made, people will try to make money. So yeah, I do believe there's a commodity aspect to this. And it's probably one of the hardest things for any of us to not be angry at. The problem with the anger for me and the frustration and the fear that I have around that is it engulfs me, not the industry. It stops me from being effective not the commodity traders. Hope that helps. Good question and good response. Um, Bill, we have two more, two, two questions in the chat bar. Uh, Bill's asking, and this is a good one because I know the story behind this one, Kevin. Bill's asking, what triggered you into recovery meeting? I almost this want to- This is a good story, I'm sorry. No, that's okay, that's okay. Uh, it's great when Marcy says, I know the answer to this. I almost want to say, you know, I can leave the room, guys. We'll just let Marcy tell my story. Between, Mar I think some of you have already read the book, maybe enough that you could probably answer a lot of these questions. Um, it's a hard ending. It's in the book, and I'm a little hesitant to give you the real details here because I don't know everyone on this call, and it can be triggering. Uh, you do know enough about my my demise, so to speak, my bottoms. I was a prostitute and uh, uh, I had lived a life that was uh, sullied and dangerous and, and very um, less than zero, minus zero. And I wasn't gonna stop. And there was no way that I was going to stop. I needed drugs and alcohol. So the problem was, <laughs> Marcy's smiling. The problem wasn't that I, needed to stop using drugs and alcohol. The problem was that no matter how much prostituting I did, no matter how much drug dealing I get, no matter how much stealing I did, and even I even had a full-time job. I was working in a factory and nights where that's all we did was we got there 30 minutes early so we could drink in the parking lot before work, everybody that worked there. So I had the perfect life. I didn't want to get rid of the life. Of course, I was so so saturated with drugs and alcohol, I couldn't spell my last name. I was very sick. But I did come up with one idea because I was running out of money every week. I couldn't keep enough money in my pocket to be able to feed the addiction. So I came up with an idea. I decided to make a New Year's resolution. And the New Year's resolution was this. I'm going to stop using drugs and alcohol for one year so I can save enough money, so I can buy enough drugs, so I can deal drugs and never have to buy them again. So, Bill, I was a high school dropout. I literally had trouble spelling, remembering to spell my last name, but that was my entrepreneurial idea. Now, I didn't know there was a word entrepreneur and I couldn't have spelled it if you asked me, but that was my plan. The problem is that when you stop using drugs and alcohol and you don't know that you are an addict and alcoholic, you go into withdrawal and you don't know what's happening. That's, that's what my, my bottom was like. And the next three to four to five days were, were hell. And you've seen it in the movies. And if any of you have lived through withdrawal or seeing a loved one go through withdrawal uh, with or without medication, it's brutal. Uh, but I didn't know what was happening. I was in deep, deep denial. And that's a word that we could talk about for a long time because the denial wasn't just about the addiction. The denial was about the abuse. The denial was about the relinquishment, the abandonment, the, the denial was full. 
So there was no way that I could even begin to unearth any of these things. But because I gave up the drugs and alcohol, and I did with the help of Michelle, who was my girlfriend at the time, get through those first days and dry out, just barely dry out. But as Marcy knows, that's really not what got me here today. It was an act that I won't speak of here because of the triggering aspect to it. It is in the book. And as you, many of you can guess, the book is a little bit tough to read at times. Okay, it's hard. But there was an act that happened and it had been happening through all the last days of my addiction. Uh, and I will say it was a sexual act. Um, and it was just awful, you know, the way I was living. And then in the first probably five days of me drying out, uh, I went back to that behavior, but I wasn't drunk and I wasn't high and I could feel it and I could see it. And I felt like, I had just lost my mind. What happened was that I had experienced in a wave, again, another one of those tsunamis, uh, without the drugs and alcohol to buffer that, to temper that, I, it was almost like the curtain went up and I saw that history. All of a sudden I saw the life that I had been living. I felt it, I saw the prostitution. I couldn't identify it. I didn't even know about the abuse that hadn't even come up on the radar. I was almost two years sober, a year and a half maybe sober before I recognized I'd been abused. But I saw the hell that I had been living and I didn't wanna get high. I wanted to die. I wanted to kill myself immediately because everything that I felt from top to bottom was like someone had just poured, you know, burning lava over me, over my soul. And that was the end for me. Um, as Marcy knows, there's a couple of pages in the book that really describes what happened. Um, but once I, I think I mentioned earlier that I, once I really realized I can't do this, I can't do this, I reached out for help. And that's what David had asked about was what did I do? But what led me to reach out to help for help was that awful sense of knowing, just knowing that I didn't belong here anymore and that I had lived such a life, so tragic, I guess, in so many ways, but so just every demonstration was now in front of me. It was like watching, a, it was like the Clockwork Orange, if any of you know that, that, that scene where I just couldn't, I couldn't squeeze my eyes shut because I still saw. And without the drugs and alcohol, I couldn't, I couldn't turn away. There's nothing I could do, but that's what turned me. I hope that I hope that answers that. Is that what you were going to say, Marcy? Is that the answer? I was thinking about how you were going to save up all this money so you could do drugs for the rest of your life. What an original idea, huh? Yeah, yeah. I was a genius, wasn't I? Uh, there's a lot going on in the chat bar, um, but there's just one here that's right in front of me. So I, I would like to share that with you, Kevin. Uh, we can go back and look at these later, but I, I'm sure I can read all of this. Um, this is from Tina and Tina says, this makes me brave to have the conversations away from here. Thank you, Kevin. Honesty matters and is life-saving. Mm -hmm. So again, the point to our stories, sharing our stories, brave enough to share, to share them in this platform in a safe environment gives others that opportunity for them to also step forward. So thank that, you, Tina. Thank, thank you, you Tina. Tina. It means a lot to me because the point of the book and the point of these talks to me has been many things, but I think uh, one of the prime ones is to reduce the stigma of having these conversations. Uh, David and I were talking about that, I think another day, which was you know, saying things like child sexual abuse is, is just fraught. Talking about adoption and abandonment and the, the pieces are, is tough. Addiction seems to be a little more common these days in many ways, but still fraught with stigma and moral dilemmas. Um, saying things like suicide, asking if we're suicidal. I love at the beginning of this, every indie, every happy hour. We're talking about a happy hour. And by the way, at the bottom, you'll see a, a little note there. There's the 800 suicide number. I mean, we're just putting it out there that these are obvious topics. We're struggling at times. And it's, it's the, the hidden, the, the secrets that really keep us sick. And in the 12-step program, we have a saying, you're only as, we're only as sick as our secrets. And so I, I don't have any more secrets, as most of you know. Right. Thank you, Kevin. Okay, and Bill, good question. Uh, Heather, would you like to ask your question? I wrote it down if you don't want to, but if you'd like to take your set off mute, you had asked about the impact of adoption, uh, yeah. how yeah, it played a part 
on and, and maybe this is in the book and uh, but i was just curious if kevin could share some about how he's his experience as a father as a parent and how adoption has impacted that as as a uh, as a parent myself being a parent yes thanks heather yeah, it's always a tough one for me to unpack. It seems like we could have started, uh, you know, an hour ago and we'd still be talking about it today. I'm, um, I'm a father of four, a grandfather of three. Uh, what I don't disclaim too often is that um, my oldest daughter's not my biological daughter. I never did. I never adopted her. Uh, those were, uh, my oldest daughter was born when I was 16. She's my stepdaughter. Uh, we're the closest of my two daughters. Um, but I love them both dearly. Um, I think that to, to answer that question, the, the real key is that it's meant different things at different times. Um, and it's been a, a real journey of understanding that my fears were mostly guiding me. And those fears were twofold and early the early days, say with my oldest daughters or even my boys when they were younger, because I really didn't gravitate towards healing from the adoption, abandonment and relinquishment. I didn't really start healing from that or even gravitating towards that until know, almost seven years ago when I read Nancy's book. Um, even though I grappled with some of the issues, I didn't delve in until then. But I think in early, the early years with my children, um, my fears really guided me. And they were fears of my children being abandoned, my children sensing abandonment. I didn't want what happened to me to happen to them. I think one of the biggest pains in my life that I've had to reconcile, uh, make amends for, uh, and continue to live my life the best I can is with my daughters because I was an addict and an alcoholic actively when they were very little. And their lives were, as many families and children of addicts and alcoholics were really devastated. I didn't come back into their lives until they were six and seven years old. And I was pretty much still a shell of a, shell of a guy. I was, I was healing as a man, I was healing as a person, but I was still a shell of a father. I had to really learn to be the father that understood um, I think first and foremost that um, I couldn't protect them from all abandonment. I couldn't protect them from all loss. Um, my job wasn't always to be there and even for my boys now uh, to make sure that they weren't hurt. My job, and this is still how I live today, was to be there for them and to be the healthiest I can be every minute, every minute possible, um, even when I don't think they're gonna need me because tomorrow they might need me and I might need to be there to support them when they've been maybe a lot, maybe they've experienced some abandonment, some loss, or maybe when I, my biggest fear would be the, that the addiction or the child sexual abuse would affect them. Now, I don't want to uh, disclose anything personal about my family, my children, because that would be unfair. I don't do it in the book either. And I do really try to um, protect, protect people's anonymity. But I will say that it's changed for me because what I realized as a parent that was uh, probably more, more devastating towards my children uh, wasn't that I wouldn't be able to, to protect them from abandonments or abuse or addiction. Um, it was that I was afraid of them abandoning me. The biggest fear that I had on a daily basis was, and it was, it was twofold. I wouldn't say it was, you know, 60 of one, 40 of the other. It was probably 100% of each. I was afraid that my children would feel abandoned and that I wouldn't be able to protect them. And I was also afraid that they were going to abandon me. And the problem with that picture was that I didn't have any tools to be able to fix that for them. So I think that the worst years of probably my life as a parent, as a father, were the ones when my own issues, if you want to call that, my own fears, my own sense of unworthiness and low worth and negative worth was reflected on my children. And it probably wasn't until a few years ago, if you go to my YouTube channel, there's some honesty there about some of those real parenting issues. 
Um, but I think that the hardest thing was to really own that and say, yeah, I understand. Uh, and, and even talk to my children about it. They're older now. They're, my youngest is 20. So it's a little easier to have those adult conversations. Um, and it wasn't just as a parent. It was as a husband. It was as a son. It was as a friend, coworker, even somebody right now just talking to you. I don't know if any of you can notice, but I tend to sit with my arms kind of strapped, strapped. I, I, it looks like I'm relaxed with my hands in front of me. But what I really am doing, by the way, uh, just so you know, is I'm holding myself. I'm hugging myself right now. It's, a, it's, it's, it's okay. I understand there's a limitation to how vulnerable I can feel in any part of my life in any situation. Um, but what I try to do now is to understand that I can have these fears. They don't always all go away. Uh, I can also have the struggle. The struggle is noble in my own way uh, to continue to struggle this way. Uh, my job or my real responsibility and my joy, I think, now is to recognize that, yeah, I, I get to hug myself, but I'm not just going to do it to protect myself. I'm going to do it to heal myself so that I can maybe when I leave this call, go upstairs and give my son Tyler a hug and go and give my wife a hug. I can open my arms to you right now if I want to. It's hard. It's really scary. I would say that for me to tell you that I'm calm and at peace because I wrote this book and that everything feels fixed now would be the biggest lie I could ever tell you. Um, there are days when I am so miraculously in the healing process that it feels genuinely like I've quantum leaped from the person I ever was. And then I'm reminded that that I have primal wound maybe scar tissue. Um, I don't have to identify myself with it daily, but it's my real privilege, I think, to continue to heal myself. See, now that I've told you that I kind of hug myself, I don't even feel like I need to do it as much. Hope that answers your question, Heather. Great. Now, Kevin, we didn't rehearse this, but you were talking about abandonment, right? Uh, and you know, it's getting to be that time and we're drawing to a close. And I had marked another piece in your book that um, made me cry. And I wanna share it with everyone and, and then we'll go ahead and close and have a little closing comment here. I mean, I think everyone here that's with us this evening has experienced abandonment and can relate to this, okay? And it is in chapter, I do wanna share that. I don't know what chapter that's in. You probably know it when, when, as soon as I start reading it. It's in chapter 14, thinking. She had abandoned me. Nothing could ever change that fact. I would always be a living reminder of what was left behind. That emptiness was my past, had become my whole life. I chose to not let the emptiness define my future. I chose to take only what I could contain within myself, something simple, significant. I laid the palm of my right hand on the step and closed my eyes, committing to the memory, the texture and grain of the wood and completely and deeply opened myself, letting her come to me. Just thought that was so beautiful. I remember when you told me about that and Sometimes I can't believe that I wrote that and gave that, gave that away. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Okay. Well, I'd like to, again, thank everyone for joining us this evening. Uh, Kevin, we, we love you. We appreciate your, your courage um, and sharing your story with us and how you're touching lives by uh, being on other shows as well, because you are available for, for speaking uh, opportunities. Uh, sharing your message through your book. We hope you will all check it out. Um, we just really appreciate you spending your Friday night with us. Thanks, everybody. Um, okay, so as a reminder, uh, Kevin will be giving away an autographed copy of his book. If you haven't put your email address in the uh, chat bar, now's the time to do that as we're drawing to a close. And we'll go ahead and choose uh, a winner here in just a little bit. Also, if you could go over to Facebook, if you haven't already, and join us in the Facebook Adoption Happy Hour page. Um, we would like to see your comments uh, from this evening's um, interview with Kevin. 
and also we'll announce the winner over there as well. Okay. So uh, Jennifer, do you have a slide for us for January the 4th? I think you do. Uh, obviously, we will not be having our call um, on the 25th because that is Christmas. Uh, so we're going to be taking a little break, holiday break, and we will be joining you uh, on, it's going to, uh, we call it a New Year's special episode, but it will be on a Monday. So mark your calendars. Uh, for Monday the 4th, we'll have Lynn Gruff and Lorene uh, Pittman on, who will lead the conversation on the Queen's Gambit. That was a, that's an awesome show. If you haven't seen it already on Netflix, um, we'll be discussing that on January 4th. So we wish all of you a happy, happy holiday season. Uh, please feel free if you're, if you're feeling, if you're feeling depressed, because I know I am, I have a mother in the nursing home that I can't see. And it's, it's really difficult. And I know we're all just suffering in all different ways uh, with COVID. Uh, but you do have a tribe here. You do have friends here. You can reach out to us via Facebook, email, uh, pick up the phone. Uh, if you feel lost and you just want to talk to somebody, just reach out. We're all here for each other. So um, does anybody have anything that they want to add before we, we close? Kevin, you have any last words? I was going to say the same thing. Um, you know, the... I've never been, I was never a social media person really in a lot of ways, but I've found that we, we have tools at our disposal. Zoom is what we're using now. This is wonderful for this kind of one and a, one and a half hours of community. It's wonderful, but I'm there. If anyone reaches out to me on Facebook or Twitter or go to the YouTube channel, I will be there to the best of my ability because this is what we're here is to be there for each other. So any, any of you want to just get to know me and we can get to, get to know each other. I think, as I said earlier, I, I, I want to do this in community. So if you want to do it with me, let's do this thing. Great. All right. Well, that's a wrap. Everybody have a wonderful holiday season. We'll see you all online, though, okay? Love you guys. Take care, everybody. Good night. Kev, just hold one second for Thank me. Thank you. You're welcome. Hold on one second. Bye, Paige. Take your time. Let the room empty. <laughs>